So, a couple of years back, I was riding my bike in the north of Central Park here. And I had what I'm just going to go ahead and call a mystical revelation. It was a raccoon, an adult, quite large, and it was dragging across the path in front of me a full half-gallon carton of Tropicana orange juice. <laughs> right? So I felt that I had seen into the soul of Central Park. Because Central Park is nothing if not this collision between the wild and the artificial. So when you're looking at this sign, you are only eight minutes away from a decaf non-fat latte or an ATM or name it, it's New York. It's a metropolis with a perfectly rectangular park in the middle. But the thing about nature is, nature doesn't know when it's in a rectangle. So, you know the birds, and you know the trees, and you know the squirrels, but now I hope to show you, in three quick steps, just how deep and how weird the nature hole goes. In uh, the late 1990s, the Museum of Natural History uh, conducted what is called a leaf litter survey. And it was in the part of the park called the Ramble here. And essentially, uh, what this is, is they look at a patch of the forest floor, and they do a census of all of the, uh, the invertebrate creatures that are there. That means every snail, worm, and bug. And they have an ingenious way of getting this done. They put the leaf litter in a funnel, and then they heat it up from the top, and all of the terrified bugs scurry away from the hellish, nightmarish heat into the preserving jar below, whereupon they drown. So this is something that you could do very easily at home. <laughs> so one of the things that they found in here that was a big surprise was a centipede that was half an inch long. There aren't really any good photos of it, but I took this photo of a centipede that I found myself. Uh, yeah, I know, you can't really see. But keep in mind that the one that I'm talking about is half this size. So, the museum people didn't know what it was, and they sent it to an expert, and his name is Dr. Richard Hoffman in Virginia. And Dr. Richard Hoffman didn't know what it was either, so he sent it to the top, top centipede guys, who are Italian as it happens, and the Italians didn't know what it was either. Because no one could know what it was. This was a completely new species. Not only a new species, but a new genus of centipede, the smallest known to mankind, and it lived under the leaf litter in Central Park. So if you go to the north of Sheep Meadow, here, you will see this. And I love this. Uh, it doesn't look like anything. You could walk by it a dozen times and not notice a thing, and countless people do that. But it is something. Now, first a word about the geology of Central Park. Geologists love Central Park. Entire careers have been built on Central Park because you can see lots of outcrops of schist. And schist, are the, this is the bones of Manhattan. And uh, if you know what you're doing, you can read this like a forensic expert. So. When you look at a photo like this, you know that that is schist. And you can judge by the color that that is something else. <laughs> now, how does a 10-ton boulder get up there like that? And it's not just here, it's here, and here, and here. And I like this one, because look at the people, they're just having a good time like nothing weird is happening. <laughs> They've turned their backs on this gigantic alien boulder, and they are aliens. They were ripped from bedrock miles away entombed in glacier ice, and they inched their way down the continent. And then the great thaw happened. And this is my favorite part. This is the part that I think adds poetry to these objects. They descended on the melt slowly, 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 and came to rest on the ground, as though placed there by a deliberate hand. They're not only poetic and beautiful, they're also actually very useful, because if you can determine the composition of a glacial erratic here, that's what they're called, glacial erratics, you can find where its original bedrock was, you can plot the course of glaciers. So what looks like just a rock is actually something quite sublime. So this next uh, part is um, just above the boathouse here. And it's a tree that is very strange. In fact, some people would say that it's eerie. But before I talk about it, I want to talk about something called the seed dispersal syndrome. And what this is, it's the way that a plant uh, spreads out through an ecosystem. And they are marvelously subtle. Uh, for example, fruit. Fruit is a lure. It's a ruse. 
Apples like fruit. Plants don't care anything about fruit. They care about the seed that's hidden inside the fruit, and then they entice the animal with the fruit, and then there you know, they have a delivery system for their seed. My favorite one, I think, are oaks and the trees that are related to oak. What they do is they drop all of their seeds, and they invite all of the greedy little squirrels to take as many as they like. Uh, with the understanding that they'll only remember where they hid like 95%. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other 5% are custom planted. <laughs> Think about it. So uh, this tree is called the Kentucky coffee tree. And this is what it does. It creates these pods high up like this, and uh, nothing eats them. First of all, they're very hard, and second of all, they're filled with a green paste that is highly poisonous, even to insects. Sometimes the seeds fall out, they fall on the ground. You can't really see here, it's there. The, uh, when the seeds fall on the ground, there there might as well be marbles. Uh, in fact, you never see a cracked one. You never see a partial one. You only see marble and mush. Now, this is what happens when finally the fungus breaks it down. Now, you don't have to be a botanist to realize that this is a very bad dispersal syndrome. And in fact, ecologists thought for years that this tree was just really bad at evolution. <laughs> and then someone had an insight, a beautiful one. And the seed dispersal syndrome clicked like magic. The problem with this tree isn't that it's bad at evolution. The problem with this tree is that it's extremely good at it. It is exquisitely evolved. But the problem at the core is the thing that it has evolved to attract went dead 12,000 years ago. So those of you who took a seed when you came in today now have a piece of mastodon food from Central Park in your pocket. You can see it's very, very hard. And I have this. I've had this in this jar of water for months. No change. If you put it in the ground, no change. The only way that you can get the seed to germinate is to imitate the gobbling mouth and the gut of a mastodon. What you do is you scar it with a serrated edge, you keep it moist, and the glassy layer dissolves. The seed swells up, and if you plant it, in a few weeks you might have this on your desk. So, why do we have to do that, you can ask yourself. Why doesn't this tree learn? Why doesn't it get a different system? Obviously this one isn't working. Why does it keep preparing this meal for a dinner guest that is never going to come? Well, this is a period of about four million years, and this is not an unlikely scenario of the period of time that these two organisms had to get to know each other. And if you look, 12,000 years is just a slipper. So, it keeps pumping out these poisoned marbles because for the tree, mastodons were here last week. Now, to put this into perspective, this is the period of time that we, as a species, have been on the planet. And step back. So this tree provides awesome perspective. And not only that, you can walk by it and you can pick up one of these pods. And because this pod was evolved to suit the creature, this pod, in bizarre ways, is the image of the mind of the creature. This is something that a mastodon likes to see. <laughs> this is a texture that a mastodon likes to feel. This is a smell. That was one of Mastodon's favorite smells. And you can walk through the park and you can scoop down and pick this up. The Mastodon has been dust for 12,000 years. But you can smell one of its favorite smells. And you're doing this in a park that's shaped like a perfect rectangle in the middle of a metropolis. But Central Park isn't diminished because it's shaped like a perfect rectangle. Central Park is enhanced because it's shaped like a perfect rectangle. It's all the more improbable and strange. And what's more, it's dynamic. And that's what makes it truly a park for New York. Thank you.